Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Wednesday, December 13th edition of the Basement Academy. Our morning psalm, Psalm 13, asks a very simple question. How long? How long, O Lord? And there's something about the human condition, the human personality, the human family, that when we're in a tough spot, one, we want out, <laughs> obviously, and we want to know from God how long we're going to have to put up with this. And, and that question sits underneath the book of Revelation in, in some ways, uh, as John on the island of Patmos, speaking to the seven churches, uh, and by extension, all Christians, right? But speaking to the seven churches there in Asia Minor who are being pressed upon because of their faith, the testimony of Jesus, how long? <laughs> and that, that question comes uh, throughout the book of Revelation from the souls that are under the altar, the, the martyrs, the witnesses who've died for their faith. And I think it fits into, it's a good question. It sits behind today's topic as we talk about the millennium, the thousand years. And so how we wrestle with our faith in and through time. So, so let's read Psalm 13. It's not long at all, just a few verses. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. That's it. Just six verses. How long? Okay. Today, as we continue on with our reflection of the last word on salvation, the image of the wedding supper and the meal, the wedding reception, uh, the grace, the inclusion, the welcome, the joy. Um, and then this image of the warfare, the rider on the white horse, our Lord Jesus going out to conquer the image of rescue and deliverance and freedom and hope. We need both of these images. Well, Revelation chapter 20 then uh, moves away from these images to something else. Maybe it continues on with the warfare image, but uh, the, the heading before my chapter in, in the version of the Bible I read says the thousand years. And so let me read chapter 20. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. 
When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Wow. That's chapter 20. Revelation 20 <clears throat> and its reference to the thousand years when these certain things are happening, right? That John records. Um, the thousand years commonly referred to as the millennium, right? This is the chapter <clears throat> that has inspired charts, diagrams, explanations, I would argue speculations, um, and no small amount of confusion. Uh, I, I will tomorrow present three basic millennial views and the return of Christ relevant to or relative to those um, views. But when people start talking about the end times, if you've ever attended a class, a seminar, a weekend, um, uh, perhaps watched a video, uh, read some books, uh, you know, the Left Behind series, uh, the late great planet Earth and others. There's much made of the millennium of the thousand years, and it's coming from this chapter. Now, other parts of the Bible get pulled in, Daniel, some Ezekiel, some Zechariah, you know, Matthew. There's some, there's some other places <clears throat> that get, get drawn in to uh, discussions of the millennium or, or, or um, teachings about the millennium. But this is ground zero, okay? This is, um, th this is where it begins. And, and John, you know, repeatedly, several times, references this thousand years and what's going to be happening there. And so there is much speculation about the, these matters. I just offer a word to the wise. Um, I'm, I'm going to read two other passages. Uh, one is from the book of Matthew. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples prior to the Last Supper, his arrest, crucifixion, etc., and he's talking about the signs of the end of the age. So, so how will we know? Uh, his, his disciples um, uh, tell us when this will happen. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That's Matthew 24, verse 3. And so Jesus speaks. And towards the end of that, beginning in verse 36, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. 
As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving, and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not let a house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. There's a lot more in Matthew 24, but I wanted to highlight that. Not even the Son knows. The angels don't know. <laughs> The Son himself does not only the Father. God the Father has set a time when these things will be wrapped up. And then in Acts chapter 1, same kind of thing, a little bit of an echo. So when they met together, this is after Christ is risen. The disciples are meeting with the risen Christ. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then he was taken up from them. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> I, I have understood Matthew and Acts as words of wisdom to guide us. Let us not speculate about the timing of such matters. When will Jesus return? When will the kingdom be established? When is the millennium? When the Father says so. <laughs> And I'm not saying that to cop out and to dodge what is clearly chapter 20 is a clear, clearly it's an unclear passage, right? <clears throat> it, it's, it's challenging. There, there, there's language here that, that is big, it's grand, which is in keeping with the rest of the book of Revelation and the purposes. And so let us recall the way John uses numbers in the book of Revelation. And we have uh, various numbers that are put in front of us. <clears throat> We've got 24 thrones. 12, it's commonly understood, maybe not perfectly agreed upon, but, but there's a general consensus. The 12 uh, Old Testament tribes and the 12 New Testament or New Covenant apostles. 24 representing the fullness of the covenant community prior to Christ, the faithful, and those since Christ, the, the, the faithful. <clears throat> We've got repeated series of sevens. You've got language of a sevenfold spirit of God or the seven spirits of God. What is that reference to? Perhaps the gifts and graces, fruit of the spirit. Well, there's nine fruit of the spirit. I, I understand. But, but this notion of seven is a complete number. We've got the six, 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 the, the, the repetition of the incomplete number or the human number because the human family was made by God on the sixth day. And so that's often what, what is understood there. Again, maybe not perfect agreement uh, amongst the scholarly community. <clears throat> and so we have numbers that come to us in the book of Revelation and virtually all of them have some symbolic or metaphoric or or by way of allusion, the seven, I think, is an allusion to the seven days of creation. <clears throat> and so I'm not saying there weren't four living creatures, but perhaps those four living creatures are in keeping somehow with other Okay, we've got four Gospels. What was it fully known by then? Yeah, by the time John's writing the Revelation, his own 
writings and those of Matthew, Mark, and Luke have, have begun to, to gain some currency. So the numbers are suggestive. The numbers help us to make connections. They help to spark our praying imagination, our believing imagination. What could God be prompting you? 40 is a stock number in the Bible. 40 years in the wilderness, 40 days, Jesus. So Israel has 40 years in the wilderness wandering. Jesus has 40 days uh, of the wilderness uh, temptation. And there's a parallel there. Those The 40 is is a generational number, right? And so in the wilderness, a generation dies. And so 40 is a stock number. 12 is a stock number. Seven is a stock number. Three is a stock number. That when we encounter certain numbers, we should, we should make a connection beyond that number itself to a bigger, uh, another part of the story. So all of that is to say, a thousand years has already shown up in the scriptures. And we may forget that. or it, it, It's not, you know, everywhere, but it is. So in, in Psalm 90, let's see if I can find that in my Bible here. Psalm 90, this is when, uh, this is a prayer, the only uh, psalm attributed to Moses and it probably has reference to the wilderness wanderings. <clears throat> For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. As Moses and family are slugging through the wilderness, <laughs> there's this reference to a thousand years. A thousand years in your sight, O God, are like a day that has just gone by. And then 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. So Peter pulls this language from the psalm. A thousand years are like a day. A day is like a thousand years. Peter employs that in the context of the church that's suffering and wondering when God's going to, when Christ is going to return, get us out of this mess. Again, Peter's writing in the same context as John is here. And so I would offer to you that a thousand years is more of a stock number. We, it's, it's a number we use to convey a long time, a time that is known to God with the Lord, a thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. We can understand a day. We cannot understand a thousand years. God understands both. God who was and is and is to come, God who was outside of time, sees all of time in front of him. And so a thousand years is the phrase used or the number used to convey Time that is known to God, but is so far beyond our own experience that we cannot know it. In a similar way, we come across an old friend. We say, I haven't seen you in a hundred years. We use that phrase a hundred years, not literally, right? You know, I'm not a hundred years old. But, but we use phrase, we use a number like that to convey a, 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 a such an enormous time, I can't even remember the last time I saw you. And so I would offer to you that a thousand years that we read in Revelation chapter 20 is serving in this way. It's making a connection to the psalm, to Moses, to the Exodus, to that wilderness wandering, that journey that was so difficult. 
because this is difficult for the churches right now. But it's a, it's a word, it's a number that is trying to say God is now going to do something that is beyond the realm of human experience, but it is known to God. And so this extensive human history that will unfold that is completely contained in the purposes of God, but it will outlive any generation of Christians. If it was going to happen in that generation, the number probably would have been 40. Okay, that's the generational number. A thousand is the infinite number, right? But it's not infinite. It's a bounded number. And so what we have in Revelation chapter 20, I believe, is a picture of a, a sovereign God who, who is at work beyond the immediate generation, the immediate experience of any generation of Christians, but is at work in a way that he is binding and consummating evil. That's what's happening in chapter 20. There, there's things that are happening. Human history is going to continue for a thousand years. Well, it's gone on for more than a thousand years, right? We're at the 2,000 year mark now from the time uh, of, of Christ. And so I do not believe the thousand years is to be understood literally as 1,365 day years with leap years tossed in every few years, right? So tomorrow I will go through the, 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 the common understandings of the millennium and I'll make my argument as to why I would, would, would tilt uh, in a different direction than, than uh, others do. So let me, let me go and stop here and uh, let's pick up and uh, go, go a little further tomorrow. Okay, let's pray. Lord, be pleased to work your purposes in our lives, through our lives, around our lives, as you have been for centuries upon centuries. For millennia now, you have been executing your sovereign purposes. And so give us the patience and the endurance of our first Christian forebears that we might prevail. And when we cry out, how long? And we want the suffering to end and the kingdom to come, Lord. We, we pray that you would keep us vigilant and watchful and prayerful and humble each day of our lives, including this day. And so we offer our prayers to you now in the name of the Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God keep you. May God bless you. May God cause his face to shine upon you this day. And may he enable you to trust him this day and forevermore. Amen.